how do we start this? Hello, farmers! I think that's the one. <laughs> Welcome to the harvest season, a very special episode where <laughs> Johnny and I here aren't in the most ideal state, but we're going for it. Um, we are going for it. <laughs> we talk about cottagecore games, allegedly here. Um, uh, Al's not here, so it's going to be a wild ride today. <laughs> but then that's that's not a pun off the the wildflowers. That that was the last episode. Um, hi Johnny. Yeah, I introduced you. This is Johnny. You all know Johnny. Yay. Um, he's I'm, here. I'm I'm back, and I'm 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 surprised that I keep getting invited back. But we'll we'll, tr- we'll do my best to not get invited back after this one. <laughs> I'm surprised I'm still here for so many episodes. I think it's just what is it? Beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yes, we are here, um, and we're here to talk about Terra Nulls today, um, yeah. and important to note up front that uh, transcriptions are available in the show notes and on the website. Um, God, it would help if I actually knew the website off the top of my head, harvestseason.club. Yep. Um, uh, so if you're after transcripts, um, I think it's awesome little um, accessibility piece that Al's added to the show, so um, Great. go and check those out. The question is, will it be able to transcribe this nonsense? That remains to be seen. <laughs> um, all right. All right, Johnny, what what have you been up to? What have I been up to? Well, like, Kev, when it's you and I, we've got to talk a little Marvel snap. I, I thought about... Or I do we? Like, we've been on so many episodes. We always talk about Marvel snap. But last season, I hit infinite. I am, yeah. I am the problem. I, I love Shuri. I hit infinite with Shuri. Uh, I'm, I'm going to play her until she's nerfed. They put in a small nerf yesterday. Let me tell you, that's not a nerf. I'm nope. still playing Shuri. She's she's so good. She's so good. Um, but I love Marvel Snap at the moment. Um, I, and I think, honestly, if you, Marvel Snap is a game that you're kind of on the fence about, you've played some games before, now is the time to get in. Like I feel like the monetization aside, right? Monetization in these games is always terrible, just put that yep. out of your mind but the the latest um developer update it was really clear communication about what they're looking to do with the metagame for marvel snap mm-hmm. they were talking about making small changes week on week like which is what i'm excited about because i like to win when i play these games so i'll play the best deck and if the best deck is current is constantly changing then that's kind of exciting for me so um, <laughs> i've been snapping up a storm uh and Kevin, have you been playing any any Marvel Snap? Oh gosh, yes, the boy. This is number one. This is the real podcast here. Um, okay, so let me let me slow down for one second. First off, for people unfamiliar, for Infinite, that's like the top rank. Johnny is now a legend among our little Snap friends. Um, incredible, absolutely incredible. Hats off to you, good sir. Um, second of all, um, the meta game, the balance has really been in flux the last couple weeks it feels like um with a lot of the top decks being dethroned except shuri johnny's deck <laughs> um and yeah the update the the well to your point i think in general they've the dev team is really good at communicating um in marvel snap their little blog updates are always very clear and to the point um and they address fan stuff or stuff that the community is talking about uh, frequently so that's good um uh, so I am, I have been playing Thanos after finally saving enough, uh, little tokens for him. Um, I'm having a lot of fun. Thanos deck is really flexible and interesting. Um, yeah, it's not the beast it was before the nerf, but it's still fun to play. Um, I have... It's still pretty good. And it's, mm-hmm. it's interesting now with, um, Hitch Monkey in the field as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how much that sort of disrupted things, which I don't think I predicted. Um, mostly because I didn't understand the interaction that it had with Mysterio, which makes it pretty dang awesome. Like, yeah. But it feels like there's, you know, if Shuri just gets that knocked down a little bit, I feel like we're in for a really fun time in Marvel Snap. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think there will probably be some fun cards being added. I can't wait for Kitty to come back. Um because I think she has a lot of interesting options, including with Hit Monkey. Um, but yeah, Marvel Snap, good times. I'm nowhere near as high as Infinite, <laughs> but um, I am enjoying the game a lot nonetheless. Um, d- 
did you see the the variants in the shop today? They're they're really good. Um, I, or the I the did. package bundle. Uh, so so they they released uh, three variants in this month. Is all all sort of animal themed, and so they're all good puns. And and, and I think the one that takes the cake is. Um, Ant Ant instead of Ant Man. It's yeah. um, just a, a variant of Ant Man that's just an ant, which was just like it's one of those things that it's it's so dumb yeah. that it's genius <laughs> and it's almost got me enough to buy it because like they're, they're all cool variants. Um, it's only five bucks. That's like the cheapest thing they've ever had in the game. <laughs> but I don't play any of these cards enough to actually <laughs> actually justify buying variants for it. Yeah, I'm getting it for sure. Um, yeah, ant ant is great. The strength, an ant with the strength and the size of an ant. <laughs> um, uh, Mooster Fantastic is probably the best Mister Fantastic ever will be. Um, and what was the third? Oh, like cat, cat, cat I don't even Captain America. They, they did kept. They did Captain America cat, which I, oh, I was like, was? I feel like of all of the ways to do that pun yeah. for Captain America, I, I feel like. Cat Tan America was the way to go, but I like Captain Amiawerka. Kind of, but yeah, no. Yeah, like I, that, <laughs> I agree. That's that's good. They kind of picked the worst of all the available. Options. Yeah, but, um, that's probably that's probably enough of our um, Marvel Snapcast. Um, join us again in a few weeks when Kevin and I find some other game <laughs> that you know can be an inroad for us to secretly talk about Marvel Snap. Other game that I've been playing, which I don't really want to admit to, but I have been playing it. I started playing RuneScape again, and like, no. and this, oh, no, no, it's 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 so bad. It's been my like. So I played old school RuneScape before it was called old school RuneScape. When it was called RuneScape, yeah. Um, I I you know eventually lost that account when they took the transition to old school RuneScape. At some point, I started again, uh-huh. and every few years I check in again and I make some more progress. And like, <laughs> I. I'm in the hole. Yep. Like, That's a farming game. <laughs> it is a farming game. Uh, it's not a good farming game. Nope. It's not even a good game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man, that's. Uh, but I'm playing it. That's classic. The baby's first MMO, like the world's first MMO, <laughs> or internet, whatever. Man, that's a blast from the past. That's oh man, good it stuff. Is. It is. The, the best thing about that game is the writing is, like, surprisingly good, um, mostly because it's all, like, basically just people trying to meme the whole time. Um, <laughs> and, and and for people that aren't up to date on, on Old School RuneScape, they're currently, like, pitching doing a new skill. So, like, the game still gets tons of updates, which is just wild to me that in, like, what? 2023, RuneScape is still getting, like, content updates. I didn't it's, know it's that. Madness. Oh, man. Oh, I'm going to whole... have to check it out. Please check it out. Let's we'll become RuneScape friends and yeah. just wallow in the misery that is like doing anything in RuneScape. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to like let's let's not linger on that any longer. Kev, what have you been playing? <laughs> Tune in next week for the new RuneScape RuneScape cast. <laughs> um, I have okay. Marvel Snaps the big one. Um, I played this game they called Terra Nil. <laughs> um, let's sunk some time into that. And, uh, aside from that, my whole world has been consumed until about two days ago. Wildflowers. That game is good. Holy moly. Um, so last week's episode was about wildflowers. I haven't seen anything yet. Nothing. Oh, man. We are, uh, full disclosure, we're already planning a follow-up episode because... Holy moly, that game is incredible and has all sorts of stuff till the very end. Um, mechanics wise, it uh, it's wow, well, might be one of the best in this genre, in my opinion. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about one mechanic here. It's not a spoiler, but uh, we didn't address it in the first episode because neither of us reached it yet. But so there's these machines called whirly gigs. They're like little flying robot drones, but with like faces. They're little happy face robots. And what they do is they'll do they automate your farming tasks. And I mean like everything. There's a one for fishing, mining, farming, livestock, chopping wood. 
Um, so you give it some resources and it'll go and do that stuff for X amount of days and just give you a whole bunch of stuff. It's an incredible, incredible mechanic um, that really lets you automate whatever you want to do. Um, uh, and aside from that, uh, like we mentioned last week, this game actually has story. Um, and it, it's not like Pulitzer Prize winning story, but it's really engaging and holy mackerel like that story went places i didn't imagine um it's and it's just such a good game i can't recommend it enough um and yeah like i said we'll actually be doing another episode so i will save more thoughts for them but wildflowers is just really a plus um i listened to that episode this week and i'm really uh like I've been on a little bit of stardew kick the last few months like sort of off and on mm -hmm. um and I have to say, like, Wildflowers was kind of one of those games I put into the Stardew Valley clone-esque style camp, and I was like, ah, I probably won't check it out. And after listening to the the episode from, from two weeks ago, I was definitely like, mm, I really want to check this out now. You should. Like, I also put it in Stardew clone, and it, I mean, it, it's hard to say that because it's, like, in the farming genre, so, like, clearly, you know, with Stardew is always going to be in the room and people are going to look at it, but it's, I think it stands enough to be its own thing. Um, so I, I heartily recommend it to anyone who enjoyed Stardew. Oh yeah. Good stuff. Um, but aside from that, um, that, well, actually, no, that's, that's kind of it. Marble snap, um, wildflowers, Terra nil. That, that's pretty much what I've been up to. It's been a very busy week for me. Otherwise I say, as I didn't see it like a hundred hours, <laughs> to wildflowers. I just want to like do like a mini check in on you know sort of games of the year because uh, I know um, at the start of the year when I was on the episode about games for 2023, I was a little bit down on games for this year, and I feel like the last few weeks, you know, with the the wildflowers wildflowers coverage and the um, uh, research story coverage from last week, like those are two games that I am really excited to get into and to play, like. I, I wonder if this is actually the year where we've got a bunch of games that look like Stardew Valley clones, and then you start really getting into them, and you're like, hmm, turns out there's something more going on here, and turns out that there's some really good games that are coming out this year. Like, 2023 might be the year of the sleeper hits. Like, oh, I mean, yeah, granted Wildflowers was last year, but I get your point, um, and yeah, I don't know, there's still Mineko's Night Market and uh, uh, Mika, um, whatever her delivery service whatever that game was called um no this is a very strong year for our little corner of the internet i i fully agree and to to totally ruin the segue that i had set up but like to to kind of go with it there's another game that's coming out very soon that could potentially be a sleeper hit of the year <laughs> with um roots of patcher uh, the 1.0 release <laughs> news the uh 1.0 release coming out on the 25th of um uh, of April, uh, which is really exciting. So for those who don't remember, Roots of Pacha is uh, Stardew Valley, but prehistoric. Um, so they've got the 1.0 coming out. Uh, it's coming out on Steam for Windows and Mac, which is actually uh, exciting for me because the the computer that I have the most easy access to is, um, is a Mac. Um, they, they sort of have indicated that it's a, a 40 plus hour game, uh, which when I sort of interpret that, it kind of means it's a finished game in, in the farming genre, in the statue-esque genre, because, you know, once you're in sort of 40 plus hour territory, um, it could mean just about anything. Um, they've added more, um, character customization options, which, you know, is, is always good to see. Uh, I'm not familiar with the current character customization options that they've had so far. Um, but probably the most important thing is 15 skin tones available. So, uh, you know, like as a big fan of inclusion in video games and people being able to represent themselves uh, accurately, um, seems like they've put in the work there, which is really um, exciting. There's, there's a bunch of other updates of things that they've included. I'm assuming that if you're, you know, paying attention to Roots of and you've been involved in some of their... Um, uh, pre 1.0 content and you'll be all across this otherwise i'm sure you'll be excited to um sort of duck in and get into this uh, i'm not going to talk through everything that they've got coming up because there's 
a ton of stuff, but I have to say, I, I remember in the, you know, sort of uh, episode for the year when we talked about Roots of Pasha, I was, I, I probably wasn't that excited about it because it did look like Stardew, but prehistoric. But looking through some of the stuff that they've got for 1.0, I'm, I'm feeling the bug. Like, I'm feeling the, maybe yeah. this is a game that I'm gonna, gonna be buying come April 25th and get into. Like, it's just... It's ticking a lot of my boxes. Like it looks really, really good. I'm excited for this one. Oh, oh man! Like I've, I, I've been so excited. I also talked about it on like up games of the year, but like twenty twenty one episode or whatever a year year before your episode. Um, uh, I'm very excited. It, I, I mean, it still looks like a Stardew clone, but. It has mammoths, so that's like already enough for me. Um, I haven't paid attention really to what's been going on because uh, I'm as I'm inf- infamously known, I'm not very keen on betas and early access and all that. So, but who cares? It's coming out in a few weeks, um, and I'm very excited to play it and maybe talk about it somewhere, someplace. Who knows? Um, Roots of Pacha, good stuff. If only we had a forum for doing that. If only <laughs> one day. Uh, um, that. Oh man, that's yeah, that's very excited. I'm and I took a tiny peek through some of the stuff. It looks like it's really coming to its own. Forty hours is really good. That's that's pretty significant, I think, for this corner of the internet, or at least the indie stuff. Um. So good on that. To, to, particularly to be like advertising 40 plus hours, right? Because I think it's one of those things with, you know, like mm-hmm. farming games where they run through the seasons, they naturally take a lot of time. Yeah. But it's very easy to bounce off these games before you even hit the end of, you know, spring. Um, and I, I don't I don't know if Fruits of Pacha has, um, has seasons yeah. like other games, but it's very easy to bounce off these games early. So I feel like it's kind of a bold move to put out. You've got 40 plus hours worth of content because yeah. kind of like um, your experience with Wildflowers is it implies there's actually a story or, or something that you want to follow through, yeah. right? I've never seen Stardew Valley be like, we've got X many hours worth yeah. of content because... And there's not really a story to Stardew Valley. Yeah. You know, it's kind of just play until you're bored and then yeah. don't play anymore. Yeah, that is an interesting thing. Because, um, yeah, I, I agree. Like, 40 plus hours denotes some sort of end goal and, and you know, like I said, maybe story or linear track, some sort of objectives to hit that 40 plus hour mark, right? Um, so it'll be very interesting to see, especially in this setting. Um, that could mean something very different from what we're used to. So I'm very excited. Um, you know what else is a 40 plus hour game? <laughs> and that's without the billions of side quests. Wildflowers. I like this game. It's getting an update so I can like it more. Um, so yeah, wildflowers has been working on updates consistently and they're just now releasing or announced the fabulous farming update. Um, we can get oh my gosh! So they're adding a whole bunch of farming upgrades. Um, you can get pigs. You can get based off the little Twitter pic. Looks like ducks, llamas, and a magical flying pig with fairy wings. Somehow, um, I'm excited for that. Uh, and we're also getting other. Uh, updated farm buildings i don't know what that means but uh uh, i went through the patch history of uh wild wildflowers when i started playing and the updates are pretty significant usually so i'm very very excited to see what this is um and most importantly i think this will be the first time i'll be farming pigs that actually fly so you know i can't wait for that It looks pretty cool on the the llama. It could also be an alpaca. Oh, yeah. Um, Alpaca farming is a a real thing. Yeah. I I may know someone that owns an alpaca farm. That's my weird bit of trivia to add to the Wildflowers update. But um, other than I like the name Fabulous Farming Update. Yeah. Um, Okay. That's, yeah, this is really exciting because the farming, Not that it's lacking, but there's definitely room to grow in Wildflowers. And, well, here we are. There's the room to grow. Uh, That's, yeah. So look forward to the Wildflowers update coming. Wait, do we have a date? I don't think we have a date. No, just 
Oh, wait, no, April 26th, I lied. 28th, I can't see, okay. Um, yeah, April 28th. That's, that's, oh no, how, oh no, I'm going to be torn between Roots of Patch and Wildflowers. No! I have two hands, uh, I can do two controllers. <laughs> good luck with, good luck with that. Um, and, and, and kind of while we're talking about games that, you know, certain people on the show might be well known for, Disney Dreamlight Valley is also getting a, an update. Um, and, and this, I guess, is sort of, you know, they've been pretty consistent at putting out um, updates. This is their biggest one uh, to date. Uh, it's the Pride of the Valley update. Adds a Lion King realm where you can get Simba and Nala, um, which is pretty much exciting for anybody with a pulse. Um, <laughs> and adds some, some, some Twitch integration, which is really exciting what? to see. Um, as yeah, uh, I don't. I don't really understand. It says Twitch drops, and like I'm not really a Twitch person, so um, I don't really understand what. Well, I mean, it's the sort of game where drops will make sense, right? There's there's costumes for your character, yeah. there's skins for your house. Yeah. Yes, they call them skins. It's really weird, you know. Um, there are alternate styles for the the villagers, so there's tons of things that I'm sure will be contained within the the Twitch stuff. Um, a few other highlights because it's um, it's so much they couldn't contain it all in, in one tweet. There'll be some new quests. Uh, apparently, you can hover around the valley. That sounds kind of cool. Um, kind of just a ton of updates. So you know, if you're looking for you know a push to get into Disney Dreamlight Valley, a go back and listen to the episode where Ellen and I covered it because I the game has no right to be as good as it is. It should just be a cash grab. And it's not, it's a really good game. I, I will admit I haven't stuck with it overly much after, you know, um, the episode that we did on Disney Dreamlight Valley. That's not a criticism of the game. It's more just, you know, these games that require you to check in daily, I find it really hard for me to keep up with. So um, it's something I plan on going back to once. Um, it probably goes into 1.0 and is officially released and there's just tons of tons of content out there for me to explore um but disney dreamlight valley is a good game you should probably play it if you like disney or if you're listening to this show because it means you like cottage core games because it is you know all of those things um this game rules and this update looks really exciting and maybe i will go back and play this the more i look at what's what's in because there's a ton of there's a ton of little things in here uh, and i'm not gonna read them through them all but um yeah it looks really exciting uh yeah, I mean, I'm a fan of Disney. I'm on this show. I should probably be playing this, um, and I probably will once 1.0 comes out. Um, nothing wrong with it right now from what it looks like, but just uh, it's more like everything else is crowding it out right now in my life. But, um, I mean, Lion King, that's that's a big one for me, so good, good on them. Uh, I can't... I'm very excited to see how this game will come out. <laughs> and when it goes from from paying money to free so you don't end up like micah paying for free <laughs> oh that was that was one of the funny spits of the year um so uh let's see what else is getting oh oh you know what else is making me excited question mark harvest moon winds of anthos because that game looks good they dropped a few more screenshots. Um, you can see some of the animals. You can see the horse, the cow, etc. Um, it's not a lot to go off, but man, that I just visually that game looks very nice. Um, more effort than I would expect from them in in pretty much anything in a Harvest Moon game. So I I want to agree with you, right? Because the first set of screenshots that they released, I was I was really excited about. It. I thought they looked really good. Like I'm I'm a big fan of the chibi esque art style that they're going for. This this update kind of killed that a little bit. They've gone they've gone too much down the Pokemon route. Where man, that world looks empty. They've got this this picture of a character holding a chicken, standing in front of a horse. And man, this world looks empty and boring and kind of dull. And I kind of looked at it and I was like, hmm, yeah, this looks like some some Harvest Moon nonsense. It's just going to be some Harvest Moon nonsense and I'm not sure that I'm into it. Like, they should have stuck with the close-ups of all their chibi, chibi nonsense because the chibi <laughs> nonsense is great chibi nonsense. But 
Uh, Look, I, I'm losing it. I'm losing it's it. It's just one screenshot. That could actually just be one angle. Like, I granted, I don't expect it to be a full lush world or whatever, but I'm I'll still be cautiously optimistic. Like they put the screenshot on the internet. They could have picked any other screenshot, but this is the one they chose. Look, Natsume historically is not great at making decisions. <laughs> Uh, but we will see. Do we have a release date for that? I don't remember. Um, keep. I don't believe I don't so. Think so we'll just keep. You know, keep listening to this show because we'll every update we'll be talking about it and hemming and hawing and going back and forth as to where we like it. Exactly. Um, next on the list for news, Spirit of the Island, and I have to admit, I don't remember Spirit of the Island at all. Um, but this is update one point three point four. Um, and and probably the most important update that any game can put into its uh, patch notes is you can now pet your pets. Um, so if you're playing Spirit of the Island, this is probably a good reason to uh, go in. And, and to be honest, I like I don't remember Spirit of the Island, but this has a really cute aesthetic going on. Yep. Um, they released a roadmap for Q2 of 2023. So. Um, in April, you'll be able to change the starting island. You can uh, uh, have a bigger building area with some of the new islands. Um, for May, they have something that's just called the Amusement Park release, which it just sounds exciting. That does. Um, and, and then in June, they're going to add some, um, some new uh, quests and so a cross-platform version release, which... For a game that I knew nothing about before I was looking into, you know, what we're covering this episode, this is a game that I'm like, really want to dig in and try, because this kind of looks pretty awesome. And those are some big updates. Um, Once I hit consoles, I'll probably dive in myself, because I agree. It's, uh, I didn't remember either, but just looking at this, it looks, this looks good. Um, I'm, I'm excited for this. Um. Boy, welcome to the episode of Boy, we're excited for things now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is very not on brand for us. I feel like we're supposed to be more pessimistic. Mm, no. Uh, I, mm, I was... Co- Cody and Bev are going to be like real annoyed with us because we're, st- we're stealing their gimmick <laughs> and being excited about things. <laughs> um, and shout out to Can You Pet the Dog continuing to influence game dev across the internet. <laughs> oh, um, good stuff. Uh, let's see here. What else? Uh, next up, another game I don't remember, but looks kind of cute. <laughs> Factory Town Idol. Um, oh wait, do I not remember? Because oh wait, I don't remember because it's a new game. That's why I don't remember it. <laughs> From the makers of Factory Town. Oh hey, look at that. It's called Factory Town Idol. I'll be darned. Uh, we have a new game that is coming. Actually, very soon, April 20th. That's right around the corner. Uh, it's a incremental-style town builder. What does that mean? Um, let's see here. You build houses and buildings, assign workers to craft stuff, sell your goods, and keep your townspeople happy. Um, oh, endless research and upgrades. So it's just like keep making your town bigger and so on and so forth. <laughs> but uh, looking at the screenshots, it looks... Well, first of all, I see menus. That's... So like half the screenshots are menus. Boy, if you like menus, you'll be happy with this game. Um Well this is a this is an idle game, right? So this is yeah. the like, you know, finally Cottage Core has a game where you do nothing and somehow it takes over your life. Um and I'm terrified because I can very easily be sucked into these sorts of games. Um I I am afraid. If, if this is the last episode I appear on, it's because my life has been <laughs> taken over by Factory Town Idol. Um, <laughs> I, I am terif- I am legitimately terrified of this game. Like this is a, you know, if you think of a um, the cottage core clicker, uh, a, the clicker suck. Yeah, it's it's a cottage core clicker. Like it's that's that's what it is. Yep. You know, um, paper. What was the paper clips one called? Um, I've, I don't remember. But but you know it. Yeah, it's it's one of those. Um, <laughs> I am I'm terrified for the future of my existence with a cottage core clicker coming out. 
Every news update. I'm already playing RuneScape. I'm already playing a clicker. At least that one has graphics. <laughs> <laughs> every update is, or every news article is just Johnny. It's just filling Johnny with more and more dread. <laughs> oh gosh. Um. Let's see here. Well, actually, what is next? Tell me, Johnny. What's next? Uh, last thing. Last thing on our news list is uh, Communite, which you know. Uh, I had not heard a, a game, another game I had not heard about before. Um, I uh, I was looking through what we were talking about this episode. Um, Communite, in the year of 2023, we have pretty bad names for conjugal games. This might be the worst. It's, it's a terrible name for a game. It, <laughs> it, it raises all sorts of things that I do not want to be thinking about when I am playing a yeah. conjugal <laughs> game. It. For me, it goes so bad, I kind of like it. <laughs> oh, what is Communite? Let's see. It's a it's a multiplayer city builder um, cool where you use your kindness to help others create your perfect world together, which sounds both amazing and terrifying. Um, <laughs> you can be a little cloudy. The people. art looks very... Yeah, the art looks very sort of like cute and wholesome, you know, in a 2D mobile style way. Um, uh, Apparently it's coming for Windows, iOS and Android, which is good because, you know, my first instinct looking to this is it looks like a great phone game. Um, So so that sounds good. Um, I'm interested to see what they do from a, a multiplayer perspective, you know, like multiplayer and cottage core is not something that you see that commonly and when you do see it it tends to feel not great you know uh i'm personally not a fan of the way stardew does multiplayer not that it's bad i can't think of a way that they could do it better but it just doesn't it's just not the vibe that that game is going for right um you know i've never really played a multiplayer game that's got past like day 10 because you start a game and then yeah, you can never get that same group of people back to play it again, right? So yeah, um, it's a tough call. It's a tough. I, I'm position. curious. Um, yeah. Cottage cores don't lend themselves to multiplayer, so I I am also curious how they can do that. And being a city builder, like I I feel like there's a little more wiggle room for multiplayer. Um, I'm interested to see what they'll do for sure. Um, totally. One interesting note: you can actually play the alpha if you look at the tweet in the show notes and scroll down like the next comment is them posting a link to the alpha uh for pc and android i don't see an ios one but um yeah check it out and i'll definitely keep my eyes on it just to see how it works um because that's very interesting multiplayer city builder you know what though right if you're tired of building cities how about we destroy them (laughs) in terra okay let's let's get into it johnny um let's start with the the first question what do you like the game terra nil i like the game um i had this game on my list for games that i was most anticipating for this year i do not like it as much as i hoped i would Uh but that's not to say it's bad you know it's just it's good but it needs some work. That's that's kind of like, you know, my, my takeaway for this game is it's good. You should definitely play it, but it needs some work. So, like, I'm still a... I, I'm like a tentative thumbs thumbs up. Yeah. That's that's where I'm at. Yeah. Um, I feel similar. Like you said, it's... There's nothing bad about it, per se. For, for me, I think it's... I, I've been thinking a lot about it. Um, like, why I'm... What feels lacking, and I think it, it might be a question of scale or content, um, which ugh, I hate to say that because not every game needs to be big or whatever. But like full disclosure, I a hundred percent of this game in like three days after it came out. Um, it's only fifteen bucks, so I don't feel bad, and I enjoyed what was there. But yeah, I don't know. I feel like I was expecting to do a little more to uh, like break down the steps of the with terraforming and all that. Um, but I get, let's just get into the detail. Well, first of all, hold on. I played on PC through Steam. That was my experience, but you played through Netflix. So let's talk about that first. Cause that's interesting and different for most games. 
Yeah, so this game is available through um, through PC on Steam and uh, on uh, your mobile device through Netflix. Um, and the Netflix uh, gaming thing has been a little controversial, I would say, because um, the, the first sort of big scale game they brought was Into the Breach. Um, if you haven't played Into the Breach and you're into strategy style games, uh, Into the Breach is Probably the greatest game that has come out in the last ten years. I haven't played um, it, and I know it's pretty dang good. It's <laughs> it's so good, uh, and, and I know that annoyed a lot of people because you know it required a subscription to Netflix um, to to do, and and that happened before the you know you have to log into a device in you know the physical location debacle, <laughs> which uh, for the purposes of this conversation, we will put to the side. Um, but I think what's interesting is the idea of these streaming platforms that produce TV, you know, or um, movie content sort of getting into the idea of gaming. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm largely for it. Like, I think, you know, the idea of supporting relatively indie developers, which I think the Netflix gaming thing has largely done, right? Like Terra Nil is not made by a big studio. I believe they're based out of um, South Africa into the breach. I don't know who that's made by. Um, maybe it's made by a big studio. Maybe it's not. But I actually think this is a good way for, you know, companies like Netflix, which are looking for ways to retain subscriber numbers, you know, to, to retain their business model, um, to do something good. Um, and to, you know, make mobile gaming more of a thing, um, to, to bring awesome games to mobile platforms. Like, I I feel like this is a little bit of a, a win-win. Like, I have a Netflix subscription. Um, if some of that money is going towards supporting the people that built Terra Nil, then I feel better today about that about my Netflix subscription than I did two weeks ago before Terra Nil was a game that was available via their platform. Um, but I'm part of the ecosystem. So I guess, Kev, I'm, I'm keen to see what your take on that is, you know, when you played this game, not through Netflix. <laughs> um, okay. It, not playing it, not through Netflix. Like it feels like it's just a steam game. Um, and you know, that's not good or bad. Just like, I don't know. It just felt like a game. Um, the, the whole streaming stuff, I just want to comment, like, first of all, uh, I am in the rare, rare subset of people that has never had a Netflix subscription. Um, but, uh, so I haven't played any of their offerings, but that said, uh, I agree with you. I do think it's a good, cool idea for these big companies to fund indie developers making these games. Um, fun fact, I wondered how Dry Dock Studios, who I've never heard of before, and I don't, I didn't look into if they made anything else, uh, was able to make Wildflowers. Turns out they were, it was produced by Apple, so they got that Apple money to make that beautiful game um, for their Apple Arcade. And so, yeah, same idea. Uh, so, uh, I do agree that's good, um, putting Terra Nil through Netflix just to, uh, just so they can get funded and make these cool games. Um, but let's let's talk about the game now. Um, so, for people who haven't paid attention to our hype for the last X amount of episodes, um, Terra Nil is a game where you are terraforming a polluted world into a nice, pretty lush, biodiverse world. Um, and, okay, here. Uh, the... The way you go about it is through menus and clicking on tiles. Um, how would you describe it? You're probably... I, I don't have the best words for this. Yeah, so I would describe it as a city builder. So, you know, if you put in your mind something like a, a Sim City or a, um, Civilization or a Cities and Skylines, huh. but take away the time element, right? So, so this game doesn't operate on time as a dimension. There's a kind of core... Um, currency that controls it but ultimately you are building buildings to help you build more buildings that influence the world around you um, and eventually sort of the, the the spoiler and the twist that they put on this is towards the end of your uh, instruction to this landscape you tear down all of those buildings and buildings and recycle them all so that the 
um, environment that you created is sustainable. So um, if you're into the idea of something like a SimCity, but you're kind of put off by the, um, you know, the fact that the world keeps progressing and things keep turning over, um, that's not a concern in this game. So so the term I would use is this kind of like an idle strategy game, right? You can think about your next move for as long as possible and the game won't punish you for doing that. You can even undo one move, uh, which is a very nice little feature. Which I may have learned an hour before we started the show. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, that's rough, buddy. Oh, gosh, I want to see that playthrough. Oh, man. Um. Okay, so... The game is split up into three, well, each, so there's, what, like, ten levels total, like, five levels, and then, like, a variant of each, and it... Oh my god, it said ten. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> did you not get the other five? So, so okay, this is, this is, I am currently on the third level. Okay. Um, and the way the bar was, there, there was, like, a progress bar, right? Yes. So after I finished the first, the first level, I was at, like, 22% of the progress. Yes. So I assumed that there was four levels. Uh, so I got to the third level, and I'm stuck on the third level. <laughs> okay. I am currently in a situation where I might need to restart on the third level because, so uh, we, when you said this game was, because uh, uh, we were planning this episode and, and Kevin finished by the time I was on this third level, I was like, ha, huh, well, I've explored like 75% of the game. That'll be perfectly fine <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> You know, um, one thing I should say, we call it a strategy game, but it it really feels like a puzzle game at times because it's not because you have limited resource like energy to do things. You can fail by running out of resources and, and not achieve the objectives. Um, I restarted a few levels myself um, because, yeah. A few of them are challenging. Now, few disclosure, like a uh, or full disclosure, excuse me. Um, I say ten levels, but they're just variants on the first five, this the second five, like different uh, general layouts. Um, oh, one more thing that we should say: each level is ugh, randomized, kind of. Um, the specific layout is different every time you generate a new one, which is kind of fun because that you know then you can. It adds the replayability a little bit if you enjoyed low or want to retry tackling it again. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so maybe let's um, talk about the the phases because that will yes. hopefully uh, help this make a little bit more sense. So, um, uh, when you first you know come upon a, a biome, um, like Kev said, it's it's sort of randomly generated, and and you have I guess a bit of a um, setup phase. And so, generally, at least in my experience, in the setup phase. You are um, building sources of power. So in the very first level, this comes in the form of windmills. Um, and you're putting down, and I, I probably should have looked up the names of the buildings ahead of this, but you're, you're putting up buildings that help, um, I guess, put some uh, grass into into the land. Irrigators. And that kind of becomes your, your irrigators. That's and the and scrubbers. And, and I... <laughs> toxin scrubbers yes so, so you're kind of cleansing some of the the natural pollutants from the land using the energy that you're generating um and using that to introduce some some low level biodiversity yep yeah basically just in the the ground itself right like the actual quote-unquote biomes not any critters or anything uh well no that no i say that no because the second phase is biome creation because once you've let's say, cleaned up the pollution and have grass growing, your next step is, the next phase is to generate different actual biomes like flower fields, forests, wetlands, etc. Those are from the first level, from what I recall. Um, generally, I think there are three yeah. per level. Um, uh, four. four. Four? Okay, sure, four. Yeah. Um, and, and the cool thing about the biome creation is they have um, different conditions for creating them right mm -hmm. so um you know if you want to create wetlands they obviously need to be near a water source in order to be created if you want to grow forests um you first of all need to burn some of that grass that you've grown around it to create some fertile ash um which trees can grow out of uh there's you know sort of like flower fields and and they need um some bees and other things around to um to produce them so that 
I think one of the things that this game has done really well is they've really thought about what is the biome that we need to create and what are the sort of environmental factors that would need to be present in order to create those biomes. So, so I think once you get to, you know, once you get through the setup phase, one of the things that starts to become available is um, some um, uh, sliders that, that indicate things like what, what's the humidity um, and the temperature yeah, of the, the, the region that you're populating. Yeah, what's the, what's the climate, right? Um, and if you, you there's sort of optional goals that you can try and complete about the the climate that you know introduce little flavor things that that make it feel like you actually want to hit all of those optional goals. <laughs> um, and, and you can only create in, in some later levels. You can only create certain biomes once you have certain climate conditions. Sometimes they're in opposite directions. Um... Like, sometimes you need to be above X temperature to create a climate, but then you need to be below X temperature to create a different biome or hit a certain objective, which is a fun little twist on the challenge. It is, right? And that's kind of where I'm stuck at the moment, is um, <laughs> the, the level I'm on, which is a sort of tundra, you know, uh, ice land style climate. I kind of was just approaching it like I approached some of the previous levels where it's just like I went through the setup yeah. phase, kind of, you know... A little bit mindlessly and didn't really think about what I was doing too much and you know tried to check off a bunch of optional goals and now I'm in the biome phase and I'm like oh my god I need to reduce the temperature by so much in order to create some of these biomes and I don't know I, I don't think I have the resources to do it so I think I actually have to reset and um and start again yeah no it's this is again this is where like the puzzle feel is coming in because Actually, the variant of that level that you're talking about, it's, it's called like a fjord or something like that, was by far, in my opinion, the hardest level. I had to restart it like a couple of times. Um, and it's it's fun because especially on the variants, they, they turn it up a notch. And sometimes you have to figure out specific little tricks that isn't quite direct but makes sense. Like, for instance, in the level where there's a lot of lava or whatever, if you can make it rain all that stuff will start to cool down and the whole climate changes. Um, so it is, I think this second level, the second phase is really the bulk of the game and where the puzzle and, and really trying to manage your resources and plan your, your little biomes that you're building up comes in. Um, but uh, big, I, I, I agree. It's, it's one of those phases that like, I think the, the magic of this game really comes out right because it's um the the first level it's very easy to play through like you can't kind of hard to make mistakes right you just kind of yep. do what it tells you and you follow the tutorial and, and it kind of comes out all right and then you get to the second level and um the second level is a sort of tropical area and you need to create beaches and tropical forests and mangrove um mangrove forests and all sorts of different things and actually thinking about where are you going to place things in order to create all of these different things and to get enough of each of these biomes to rehabilitate the area becomes a real sort of challenge. And, and then I kind of hit the third level, right, where you need to create all of these things, as Kev said, with, with different um, uh, that need different conditions in different directions. And I'm struggling to create like even small percentages of the things with the resources that I've got because I, I planned so poorly, right? I was just not thinking about the need yeah. to create biomes. And um, it's one of the things I think is really um, magic about the game. So the game has three difficulty levels and I, I started playing on the, the middle difficulty level. Oh, I did too. Um, yeah. And, and so I think on the easy difficulty level, you know, some of that resetting stuff that we talked about, I don't think that that's a, a, an issue on the easy difficulty level. You can kind of just you know um it's a lot more free form and creative it's kind of closer to a creative mode from from what i understand oh okay yeah, um, yeah that makes sense i wondered why where that was but yeah that would be on the easier level just no resources i would guess yeah 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 uh, exactly um but the the puzzle element of it is actually just like compelling and it feels uh punishing in the way that it's like oh, if I had understood the information that you had told me better, I wouldn't have made this mistake, right? Which is really hard for puzzle or strategy-based games to do. And I think it's one of the magic things about this game that's like, yeah. actually, if I had understood better, I could have made better decisions. And I often don't feel like it's the game not telling me things, which is a real risk with a game like this. Yeah. 
I, I agree. Um, sometimes, like, yeah, like, I believe it was the third level where you really... Because, yeah, the first two levels are pretty straightforward, and then the third level throws a few curveballs at you, and it catches you off guard. But they make sense. It doesn't feel unfair. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with that you, you, Yeah, no, you're... You're, you're totally right, because that's the other aspect. Is it's not that the games, the, the things that feel difficult feel um, challenging within the way the game's set up, but they make so much sense in terms of what you're trying to achieve in the world, right? Mm -hmm. the, um, in in the, the level that I'm stuck on, the biomes that I'm trying to create, some of them require really low humidity to enable you know certain things to grow and follow, flourish, and other things require really high humidity. Um, and, and needing to balance that and to think about, oh, I need to focus on creating this biome, then I need to raise the humidity and create the second mm -hmm. biome is like a really nice sort of little logic puzzle to yep. go through. And, and and it makes perfect sense in terms of those two different yep. biomes. Yeah, absolutely. Right, because, yeah, the tundra, right, you got to make it cold to make snowy areas, but before you got to, it gets too cold. You got to build a forest, or else they won't grow, and that makes total sense. Um, I will give one little piece of advice to anyone who wants to try this out. Um, the little optional tasks, uh, th I think they are very helpful because one, they will reward you more resources to play with, and and two, I think they can help guide you along these little challenges sometimes. Um, or alternatively, they also just throw a curveball and make an interesting extra challenge to go for but definitely keep an eye out on those extra optional goals um so so one thing um that i want to chat about a little bit in the second phase because it was it's a very interesting mechanic that i've not seen before in, in any of these city builder games is the the idea of the monorail um so the monorail the, the idea behind it is that you can transport buildings and you might have to build a building building in a certain environment uh, but it will have a different effect once you transport it to um, another sort of location. So I think that the map I'm on currently, there's a certain building that I can build and it'll create a bunch of lichen on rocks uh -huh. that are near it when I build it. And if I can move it into the water, it will create um, some sort of coral reef. The interesting thing about it is it requires, you know, certain placement of your monorails and being able to link things. And it requires you to be very intentional about where you're placing things. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you found that mechanic so far. So, I've, well, looking like back, I haven't played many city builders, right? So, and this is definitely an interesting mechanic compared to, well, the rest of the game. Um, at first it threw me for a loop. I think I botched my first monorail system, but once you understand it, I think it's a pretty neat, uh, mechanic and it's, yeah, because like you said, it becomes a question of where you're placing things, being very careful, right? Because you don't want to waste resources and put a bunch of them close together, but you still have to connect and be able to access different parts of your setting or whatever to get your building from point A to point B. Um, so I really enjoyed it. It was a fun mechanic. And, uh, it, and then it becomes even more interesting in the third phase, which I think, are you ready to talk about third phase? Yeah, I, I guess just before we quickly jump yep. there, I, I kind of had the same take on the monorail, yep. right? Where when it was first introduced, I felt kind of like a little bit annoyed. And I, I, I think I also botched my first monorail implementation. Um, and then as I came to understand what that mechanic was doing more in the game, I really came to appreciate how much depth that, that was adding yeah. to the level that I was playing. Yeah. And that's kind of been my feeling so far is everything that I find that they introduce and they say, oh, this thing has this limitation, yeah. right? You can only place this building here. And you have that initial like, but I just want to place it anywhere, right? right? Like it'd be so much easier right? if I could place it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it it's, it's one of the... Yeah, it's so masterful that what they've done in this game that it's like actually all of these limitations they make yep. sense. They are they add to the puzzle and strategy complexity of the game. Like there is something truly magical in what the developers have managed to achieve here with striking the right balance between this is an interesting puzzle. It's not insurmountable, 
and it makes sense in the world that we have constructed yep. for you. Yeah, definitely. That is maybe the game's greatest strength as a game, at least, um, like mechanics wise and whatnot. And it, it is, that's why I stuck with it. Like, I just kept playing it nonstop until I 100%ed it because I just enjoyed that aspect of it so much. And now that I remember there's a hard mode, I'm probably going to go back. Um, yeah, and the monorail, I think, is kind of the best example of that because it's it's a pretty clever and fun mechanic to add to the game. Absolutely. Um, and, and I will say that, like, you know, the, the, I think the reason I haven't 100%ed this is... This game requires a lot of yep. thought, uh, and I have been going through work stuff TM. Um, this means I get home and I don't have a lot of like brain space okay. available. And I've opened Terranil many times, and I want to play it. And I look at my next decision point, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can make this right. So this is the game that I know once I have those mental spoons available to deal with, I will be a hundred percent going through and completing it on the current difficulty. And I cannot wait to go back and try and complete it on the hardest difficulty. And I bet that is going to be exceptionally difficult and a really fun yeah. challenge. To yeah. Do. Oh gosh. Yeah. I'm scared because some of those later levels are real, real tough already. So, oh gosh, I can't wait to try hard mode. I'm, I'll definitely do that. Like right after this. Um, but I've, I've stopped you talking about phase three for like, that's fine. Minutes, that's so, fine. So I mean, good. there's a lot to talk us about, about phase three. three. Fine. Um, Phase three is the cleanup phase, um, which this is an interesting spin on this sort of game and really in line with the message of the game where all the stuff that you've built to re uh, to terraform the land and, and clean up the pollution. Now you have to tear it down. Um, you have to, yeah, get recycling drones or whatever and tear down your buildings and you actually build like a little airship um to uh to exit the planet or the area and let just yeah just let the animal the biomes take over and this is also where the animals come in where you have to start introducing animals um so yeah so so i wanted to talk about the animals a little bit because you know i know we talked before about the the puzzle of creating the biomes as being sort of the the magic of where the game comes in. Mm-hmm. The place where you understand that magic is in reintroducing the yep. animals, right? Because there's there's getting enough of each biome to to meet the requirement. Um, but actually, to there's there's six animals on each mm-hmm. map, um, unless that changes in, in later maps. Um, oh, six animals each level. But, yeah, and so each animal has specific requirements that they need to be reintroduced um so i think for example you know in the first map uh deer require wide open plains right really really easy requirement to hit um in later maps animals will require more conditions to be met and it's a really fun way of kind of assessing how well you've done in terms of setting up your your biomes and the way you've restored this world um is how many animals can you actually reintroduce if you can reintroduce all six then you've nailed yep. it you only need three i think yeah. it is to um to complete the level but it kind of sets this nice little stretch goal that's like did you do this really well or did you kind of do it in like the easy way and get uh-huh. through it you know like i think it's a really it's it's such a smart way of turning this phase of the game that could just be tear everything down go through the motions like it's it's kind of a you know the easy slope of you completed the hard yep. challenge and it turns it into something that's like this like bit of anticipation bit of like do i have the resources to go and like you know put an extra forest or whatever i need in this little space to try and get this final animal that i'm needing it's a really really fun little mechanic at the end that i think just is again like i, I i've said the word magic a lot but i think so much of what these guys have done is just it's just magic. It's so good. And I think the animals, the reintroducing animals mechanic is a great example yeah. of that. It's a great way of doing, assessing how well you've done without being like, you got an A grade for this map. Yep, absolutely. Um, and, and like the game doesn't really give you a grade or judge you on anything aside from maybe like the, the progression bar. Um, but 
it definitely sucks when you realize, oh, I can't introduce this animal because I don't, I didn't build a forest next to the beach or whatever. I didn't do the right conditions. Um, and, and that's all on you. Um, and it, yeah, it's a very fun and clever way. Um, I really, and yeah, it's, it's a really nice touch for the last phase of the game. Um, and, and it adds a lot of repairability, yep, right? Absolutely. Because on your first planet, why would you know that you need to place a forest next to the beach? There, there's nothing, um, they, they're not giving you knowledge that you shouldn't have, yep. right? The, that knowledge comes from the fact that, oh, I've tried to recruit the last animal that I needed and it's not hitting this one requirement. Like, I, I think on the second map it was um, one of the animals. I just didn't quite have the right number of uh, beach mangroves and ocean to mm-hmm. get one of the animals. Yep. And I tried so many spots and I scanned and mm-hmm. I scanned until I ran out of resources. <laughs> And ultimately, I had to give up and say that I just didn't have the right spot for this yeah. animal. But I wouldn't have known that going in. And it's actually given me a reason to be like, oh, I really want to go back and replay that and think about how would I have done that yeah. differently. And, and obviously, the next time, it'll be a slightly different version uh-huh. of that uh, uh, of that map. But it's yeah, and and it's a really compelling reason to go back and replay. To reiterate, it doesn't feel unfair exactly because it makes sense. You just wouldn't know about it. But and but yeah, it just gives you a reason to go back and say, okay, next time I'm gonna go with that in mind to try to build the forest next to the beach or whatever. Um and Yeah, absolutely. It's the it's the consequence of your action. And and ultimately I feel like, you know, um I think every time I've been on the show this year, I've said, you know, the one thing I want is for games to have a point of of you and something that they want to say and and terra nil is not just a game about restoring a planet it's also a game of you know consequences of your actions because you make can make some choices really early on in the playthrough of a map in terra nil that ultimately will mean come the end of the game when you need to reintroduce some animals you may not be able to reintroduce that last animal and to kind of say that's okay you only needed three out of six to to finish the map you know, obviously, as as people that play games, we like to get to six out of six because that's what we've been trained to do. But part of this game is saying, you know, you didn't know, and that's that's okay, and it's okay to to move on and to progress in the game. You can come back and and try again later and try and get it perfect, but that's not sort of the initial point of this game, uh, which which I really. Um, which I really like. And I think, you know, final point on the animals is just the, uh, or, or final point for me on the animals is that reintroducing them is about making, you reintroduce them to stabilize the ecosystem that you've created, right? So to say, yep, I, the human, have created this ecosystem, but I, the human, am not the way to keep this ecosystem to sustain. Absolutely. It's really important that animals are there to do that. Yeah, it's, and it, it really makes it, it's the really nice cherry on top that makes the, whole ecosystem come to life because then it feels just a little more dynamic and, and bustling and it's really nice to see um one of my little favorite features of this game is when you actually finish the level you have an admire button is that what it's called i don't remember it's something like that you click on it just to look at your landscape it's, admire. <laughs> yeah. it's so good um and again, right, that's one of those little things that I feel like the developers of this game have put in because they understand why someone who is playing Terra Nil is coming to Terra Nil. The fact that it's not just about the getting to the next level. It's not about getting 100%, but actually sometimes it can be about creating something that means something to you and recognizing that you created that and just giving you the chance to look over that right like to me that's one of those little features doesn't need to be there but it totally speaks to the mindset that has been brought to terra nil and why there's a high likelihood that if you are listening to the show you should be playing this mm-hmm. game yeah um and one more important item i think that uh, probably should have opened with but um i think it's like 10 percent of sales or something like that goes to I can't remember what charitable organization to, uh, you know, help with ecological conservation and animal stuff. I don't, again, I don't remember the specifics, but 
they're really putting their money where their mouth is. Um, so, you know, hats off to Terran L. Um, that said, though, do you have any criticisms or see any flaws with the game, Johnny? Uh, one minor criticism, um, and, and uh, to be honest, I don't know how you would fix it, but I think there could be a little bit more they do from a tutorial information perspective. So there's kind of a, a guidebook or a book that you read for each zone that sort of gives you some information. Um, I personally feel that I would like a little bit more. Um, there's a few instances where I felt just a little bit confused. Yeah. You know, the first time working out how the animal scanning worked, I thought the animal building could only scan in its region because that's it. So pretty much every other bu- uh, building that you build works in a certain region. So I thought I had to build animal buildings all around the map to scan. Yep. Um, I didn't understand that you could just build one and then it would scan yeah. anywhere. Um, so, so I think tutorial could use yeah. work. Um, but but I also think that's a true statement for most mm-hmm. games. Like tutorials are really hard to do, so I don't want to overstate that criticism. Yeah. Um, but it is really important for a strategy puzzle style game like Terra Nil that you really understand yep. how each decision you make is impacting. Yep. And and to jump ahead a little here, um, they've already announced that they're working on updates, of course, and 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 you know, refinements, and I'm sure that will be addressed because I imagine that's one of the bigger pieces of feedback that they're getting from the community because it feels like it's one of the few you can actually talk about because the game's so well done. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, optimistic they'll address that in the future, but, but I do agree. Um, I, one thing I want to say is, and this is not a knock on the game. I think this is just my own personal preference. Um, I think I just want a little more from the game and and that's a good thing because like i enjoy the game so more so much i want more um not that it feels necessarily small it feels an adequate size but like six animals per map i'd love to see that double to 12 or whatever i just i just like animals so you know um or a few more juggling a few more biomes per level would be fun too um could they add in the future maybe i kind of expect it hope for it um but again that that's kind of a personal preference thing um and really a compliment to how well the game is because i want to experience more of it um yeah i i think that's a great point right because uh like you know clearly i'm not as far (laughs) towards the end of the game as (laughs) i thought i was um but i had a similar thought right that it's like well you know when i thought i was you know one or two levels away from um finishing you know i was kind of like i I didn't want to play through it too fast because i wanted to experience as much of it as possible and i I see huge potential for you know terra nil to have those sort of you know freestyle modes where maybe you need to you know combine some like it's almost like go super procedurally generated where it's like (laughs) will this even be possible to complete sort of deal right like oh that's a good mode the the difference between each of the maps is is huge right and you could imagine certain map structures where it's like can i do this and and if you can do it it's like man that would be a real accomplishment that's (laughs) genius randomizer um, mode oh that'd be so good (laughs) oh i'd love that um yeah but again, to bring up you know news article that or news bit that we shifted to this section, they're they're announced. Well, first of all, they're taking a break and will deserve good on them, right? Good for any dev team to take time off after getting the game out. Um, but they are going to first ad- one address the uh, bugs and some feedback. Um, that's it. I didn't really encounter any bugs or significant performance issues but uh anyways um and then after that they will look into expansions and you know content updates so no specifics or timelines from what i see but that's fine they can take their time um in the meanwhile just more people should play this game there's a hard mode that i'm going to revisit after this because i forgot about it um but overall terra I, I enjoyed it thumbs up from me do you have any other closing thoughts on the matter johnny Thumb, thumbs up for me as well. And, and playing on mobile, haven't really experienced any bugs or anything. Although I will say, if it's um, 
uh, it's probably better set up to play on Steam. You know, playing on a, a phone screen yeah. is just a tad small for what you're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Even on um, PC, like, zooming in to admire some of the stuff was kind of hard because it's, it's, I don't know, just such a big overview, like, zooming in. So, yeah, I imagine on phone it's a bit tough. But uh, other than that, would totally support everything you said. Like if you're if you're listening to the show, there's a high likelihood that you will enjoy. Doing yeah, it. and it's for a good cause. Again, the charitable donation is that they make is very admirable, and I encourage even if you might not play it, I encourage. It's only fifteen bucks in U.S. American dollars, so I. Or if you have Netflix and want to play on your phone, it is. Oh, free. there you go. So go ahead, give it a download, give it a buy, um, Terra Nil good on them i'm i don't think the game disappointed i want a little more but again i think that's a compliment um and i look forward to the future because we live in 2023 where this is not necessarily the end of the game um so very much looking forward to the future and, and just one final comment so i've looked up their yeah. website uh eight percent of all of their profits from steam sales steam sales will be donated to endangered wildlife trust which is a south african-based conservation organization whose work uh, really resonated with the team that produced this game. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that they're a um, South African-based yeah. development studio. Um, so I really like to see, you know, local producers supporting local charities, um, and that that money will go to um, works uh, that involves habitat preservation, protection of endangered species, and biodiversity preservation. Yep. So, you know, just totally aligned with yep. the the core of this game. So um, I'm probably going to go on and, like, just buy this on Steam just to <laughs> support them. Yeah, that's the spirit. It's worth it. And try it out on PC. Maybe he'll enjoy it more again or more. Um Absolutely. So yeah, there you go, folks. I think. Well, first, so I guess we can wrap that up for Terra Nil. Um, Johnny, do you want people to find you on the internet? Mm, if you want to find me on the internet, there's this really cool thing that you can do, and that's called going to uh, Patreon.com/slash/thspod and signing up for the Patreon. That gives you access to a Slack channel um, that I participate in, which is the place where you can complain about my opinion. I usually say we can complain about my opinions, but I've been weirdly positive this episode. <laughs> so um, just like come and be excited with the rest of us about, you know, the rest of 2023. Come be excited about Terra Nil. Uh, come be excited about Roots of Pacha and all of the other amazing and, games that we've got coming. And up. actually, I jumped the gun a bit here because I forgot we agreed to do this. Um, one thing you can do on this amazing little Slack is post questions and suggestions. You can also do that through the... Uh, uh, harvest season website uh, harvestseason.club um, if that's correct I hope that I got that right um, but anyways we did want to address our first question from said channel uh, so let's let's do that real quick because it, it's a fun one and not uh, I don't think it's too deep here cat uh, from the slack asks what in your opinion makes a game a stardew clone and does that make you want to play it more or less usually um, you know, what factors, art style, etc. Um, okay, so this is, I think, a very fun first question for us to address. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the floor, Johnny. What are your thoughts on Stardew clones? So I think the, the, the first thing that makes me think something's a Stardew clone is just kind of the combination of farming, fishing, combat in a mine, some low-level, date, you know, dating sim style aspect, and kind of that, you know, uh, I'll say the wrong word and you can correct me, but like sort of 2.5 D ish style yeah. that Stardew was done. That, that kind of just like makes me think Stardew. And, and, you know, uh, I've talked about how excited I am for roots of Pacha, um, this episode. And it's taken a while for me to get there. Right. Because a lot of my instinct for that was that was Stardew Valley clone, but prehistoric. Right. right? And it's kind of because those mechanics, uh, there the art style is there it, it's kind of just got you know it's like 80 percent feels like stardew and they've just sort of tweaked that that 20 percent yep. you know often when i'm looking for something to differentiate itself from a stardew valley clone it's like one of those core things needs to be significantly um different there's a another game that's come out recently it's is it sun sun haven sun harvest Sunhaven, there we go. Um, 
And to me, that just looks like Stardew Valley, right? And I've, I've just seen a little bit about it. It looks like a really fun game. It looks really cool. But ultimately, am I excited to play it? Not really, because I've played Stardew Valley. I've played a lot of Stardew Valley. I'm still exactly. playing Stardew Valley. <laughs> Do I want to play new Stardew Valley where I need to relearn a bunch of stuff? Unless that game has something really interesting going on, I don't know that I do. So so when I see a Stardew Valley clone, my initial instinct is I'm not that excited about it, right? There's the one coming out uh, maybe this year. I can't remember the name of it, but you're running it in. Um, and it has mining it has all of the same things that i expect from stardew valley but for me if you're running it in right like make it based around hops and making beer and making yeah. wine and you know killing a boar and roasting that over a spit right like make it really focused on running it in don't make it like go and harvest 20 more carrots because <laughs> i've harvested so many things like I just want to do something different, and it's not because Stardew is bad, but I've played Stardew. Right. I want to play something different or something new or at least have something to say in the construct of telling that sort of story. Right. Okay. Oh, that's that's very good thoughts. Um, I Okay, this is, might be a slight deviation, but here, here's a small question for you. Um, did you play any farming games before Stardew, Johnny? Well, so <laughs> does RuneScape count? Uh, no. So, 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 in the way we think about quarter core games today, okay, no. all right. Um, Stardew, no. Stardew is my okay, interaction, right? So it's my base. All right, that's that, that's good enough. Um, that's a good enough answer because here here's the because I'm interested because I think this second question I've asked uh, affects our answer to Cat's question because I played. Uh, the original Harvest Moon on the game, or the the one on the GameCube, the uh, Wonderful Life, the original one, um, before Stardew, right? So for me, a lot of those mechanics and things aren't necessarily Stardew because Stardew was the Harvest Moon clone originally, right? Um, so for me to answer Kat's question, I think a lot of it comes to the presentation, the the art style, right? What screams Stardew clone to me is when I see a 2D pixel, you know, uh, similar art aesthetic to Stardew Valley. Um, and again, Roots of Pacha has that, right? It's 2D pixelated and like very similar proportions and kind of general art direction as Stardew. Um, that for me is what screams uh, Stardew clone, right? Because... Looking at wildflowers, um, it has all the hallmarks of mining and fishing and farming and relationships and so on. But does it feel like a Stardew clone? Eh, not, not really. Like, I say that for a point of reference. Um, but wildflowers really stands on its own. Like, you look at the screenshots when you play, it doesn't feel like a Stardew game per se. It feels like its own game, right? Um, and I think... Some of this is a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of problem, for lack of a better way of describing it, right? Because, so we're both Pokemon fans, right? Anytime a monster collecting game comes out, it's going to get compared to Pokemon because it's the Titan in the room, right? I think we have a similar issue in this corner um, where any game that comes out in this genre is going to get compared to Stardew because that's just the Titan in the room. Um, so, so because of that, um, yeah, I think the presentation, the visual style is really what takes it for me. And the farther you get from it, obviously the better for me, because I think that's really where you can get your own identity as a game. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a really good point, right? The, the idea of Stardew being the Titan. And I think ultimately it's like, so if you want to do what that, what that Titan is doing, you need to have that unique point of view because if you're going to copy it, ultimately it's going to be, I hesitate to say a worse version, but you need to be, you're almost doing something that makes it not comparable, right? right? Because once you're entering the arena of you need to be compared against Stardew Valley, <laughs> it's a hard comparison because I have got such a positive framing of yep. the game. Yep. And you know, it's, it's, 
in the video game zeitgeist people have spent so many hours on it like it's you know if, if stardew came out right now how would it compare to other games right that's, that's a whole different thing but it's the one that's kind of leading the pack and so yeah how are you going to stick out compared to stardew that's the ultimate challenge yeah and ultimately if it's an yeah if it's an incremental improvement it's like but i've put so much time and energy into stardew yep. Do I really want to put that energy, time and energy into a game that's only an incremental improvement on Stardew Valley? No, yep. I don't. Right? Like that's that's ultimately the answer. So it needs to be a stepwise change yep. or a stepwise improvement on what Stardew Valley yep. is doing. Uh, one final note on this. Um, I want to point out Kat added a comment that uh, her thing is uh, that when they have the little, you know, the rectangle tool ui bar at the bottom that screams stardew cloner and that's that's definitely a red flag for stardew clones um because you know that's a ui thing that's definitely a little more wiggle room that you could play around with um and and i think that's something that uh we've potentially talked about before on the show right it's like the one thing that stardew valley does not do well is inventory management and yet that's the one thing that everybody seems to copy and it's not good just do it better let us have infinite inventory I'm sick of building chests. No more building <laughs> chests. Like, just let us carry stuff. It doesn't matter. Every other game genre does it. Just let us carry <laughs> stuff. Mm, I forgot about that. has been a hot minute. I forgot about building chests. Oh, good good times. Um, thank you, Kat, for that question. That was fun. Um, so, yeah, please feel free to join. No, no, don't feel more than free. Go do it. Go join the Patreon and so you can access the Slack and ask us questions like this, and we can get some fun chats out of that. Um, okay, uh, back to the where can people find me. Um, I'm at Cooper Prez on Twitter. Go see my retweets or at Spider Square to see the every now and then art I'll post, which is 2D and pixelated, but not Stardew style. It's Pokemon style. That's what I do. Um, uh, you can also, on Twitter while you're there, go to at THSPod to get updates on the show news drops that al puts out episode updates yada yada uh harvest season not club i got that correct you can go there for feedback if you want to do it without the slack which i don't know why you would but it is there if you haven't joined yet you're waiting on that slack email uh you can go there to drop feedback you can see show notes links to a lot of the stuff we talked about on this episode um and again patreon.com slash ths pod uh i think that roughly covers all the general housekeeping thank you johnny for joining me on this very special episode of terra nil thanks kev this has been a lot of fun um everyone go play terra nil yep please do and thank you al and until next time dearest listeners have Have a a good harvest. harvest The Harvest Season is created by Al McKinley, with support from our patrons, including our pro farmers, Kevin and Stuart. Our art is done by Micah the Brave, and our music is done by Nick Burgess. Feel free to visit our website, harvestseason.club, for show notes and links to things we discussed in this episode. Or de- destroy the harvest with your incinerators or whatever that they use in Terra. <laughs> yeah. uh, or harvest a bunch of hops and drink uh, those. Do you reckon Al will pick up that I was really drunk for uh, this episode? Have you? <laughs> and I was a bit sleep deprived. There's your post credit sequence.